Hej och eh, varmt välkommen till Börssnack med Hansen och Olavi. Ja, det är jag som är Erik Hansen och jag jobbar som marknadsanalytiker på IG. Och jag heter Jonas Olavi, är styrelseproffs, trader och livsnutare i största allmänhet. Och golfare. Och golfare. Härligt. <laughs> ja, vi har kommit till avsnitt 100. Ja, helt otroligt. Helt otroligt. Uh, över två år sedan som vi uh, på golfbanan där bestämde oss att vi skulle börja podda. Mm. Hur känns det? Fantastiskt roligt att det har blivit så många och det har varit jättekul resa under de här åren. Vi har lärt oss oerhört mycket och jag hoppas att vi har förmedlat det och annan visdom också. Mm. Och, eh, idag då så spelar vi in torsdagen den 8 oktober. Eh, gillar ni podden så ska ni såklart eh, prenumerera på IGs eh, Youtube-kanal. Eh, podden och mycket annat läggs upp där. Jag eh, tycker också att ni ska följa mig och eh, Jonas i sociala medier. Jag finns på Instagram och Twitter. Mm. Du finns på Twitter och ja. TikTok. <laughs> Nej, <laughs> det kanske jag ska börja med. <laughs> ja. Ja, vi lägger ut länkar i poddbeskrivningen i alla fall. Och Börsnack är podden då som sponsras av min arbetsgivare IG. IG är en av de största globala tradingmäklarna. Vi erbjuder ett brett utbud av marknader, bra tider och det är kraftfulla plattformar. Det finns till exempel möjlighet att automatisera sin handel om man vill köra någon algo. Man kan till exempel också handla dygnet runt kvoterade turbovarantor i ISK. Det kan man inte göra hos någon annan mäklare. Så gå gärna in på ig.com för att läsa mer. Glöm inte att det är produkter. Läs på ordentligt och all handel innebär såklart risk. Ja, Jonas, vad, vad är vi kommer att prata om idag då? Ja, vi har ganska mycket på agendan. Det har hänt mm. väldigt mycket på den geopolitiska agendan. Smittspridningen har letat sig in i Vita huset. Vi kommer att prata lite grann om det då. Det har ju varit en ganska bra period för fordonsrelaterat. Och vi ser ju att siffrorna börjar ticka upp från avgrundsnivåer. Och det har ju fått en del bolag att börja röra på sig. Och vi har sett omvända vinstvarningar. Sen var ju Pontus Schröder som har varit med i podden tidigare och föreläste på staff och du ska dra lite slutsatser mm. från det där seminariet då. Och sen en liten varningens finger kring fangbolagen har kommit lite motstånd som gör att man kanske ska börja fundera på var stopparna sitter någonstans då. Mm. Vi har en intressant gäst med oss också. Absolut. Då har vi Europa-strategen på BCA, Bank Credit Analyst, Daval Joshi, som är med oss på länk. Mm. Det är superkul såklart för BCA är en av världens ledande analyser när det kommer till Global Macro Research. Mm. Så det känns stort att han är här med oss idag över länk. Då. Mm. Passar bra till ett hundraårsjubileum. Absolut. Jag tycker vi hoppar in direkt i fem snabba frågor. Det gör vi. Hi and uh, welcome to uh, Bush Snack, uh, Mr. Joshi. Um, we would like to start you off with uh, five quick uh, questions, if we may. Eric. Sure, go okay, for it. Yeah. All right. Uh, st- stock market uh, higher or lower uh, at the end of the year? Higher slightly. All right. Would you prefer value or growth stocks in a 12-month period? Definitely growth. Right. Okay. If you need to choose uh, fundamental or uh, quantitative uh, analysis? So I will say quantitative so long as it is fractal analysis, which is one of my favorite forms of analysis, which we can speak about later. Who will be the runner up, Trump or Biden, or does it even matter? Who will be the winner? Yeah. You mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I think Biden will be the winner, but I think we're o- overstating the importance of the election. Emerging markets or developed markets uh, during uh, 2021? Developed markets, for me. All right, då kör vi. Det gör vi. Börssnack med Hansen och Olavi. Ja, Jonas, uh, Stockholmsbörsens breda saxindex var i veckan uppe på ny uh, all-time high. Mm. Uh, börsen är fortsatt uh, stark, uh, mm. måste man väl säga. Uh, trots att det har skett lite händelser geopolitiskt- uh, mm. Trump var också ute på Twitter och sa att han skulle skjuta på stimulanspaketet till eftervalet. Ja, absolut. Marknaden föll initialt på det. 
Men återhämtar sig väldigt eh, snabbt eh, dagen på då. Mm. Så det, det är ändå ett tecken på att eh, marknaden är stark när den skakar av sig eh, negativa nyheter och sådär. Mm. Anledningen var att han eh, flaggade för att han skulle skicka ut checkar till alla amerikaner så att han eh, ger och tar ja. lite grann då. Och det här är ju någonting som eh, förbättrar hans chanser att bli återvald men eh, demokraterna vill ju inte riktigt att eh, man ska hålla på pytsa utan man behöver ett större stöd för att hjälpa de olika staterna. Och det kommer bli mer strid om det, men det var ju också anledningen att han ändrade på sin argumentation under dagen. Men den stora händelsen var ju att han blev faktiskt drabbad av covid. Mm. Och eh, lades in då på ett militärsjukhus i ett par dagar. Men mirakulöst nog så verkar han ju vara helt symptomfri nu. Så att fantastiska droger de har där borta. Uh, aktiemarknaden här då. Uh, mm. Jag kan notera ändå att uh, nästan 80% av uh, bolagen på Stockholmsbörsen handlas ovanför 200 dagars uh, snittet. Mm, det, vill det är säga, starkt. Uh, ja, precis. Väldigt starkt. Uh, så att uh, de, en klar majoritet av bolagen handlas i stigande trender. Och det här brukar vara positivt på om man kollar över tre månaders sikt. Då. Jag har en annan breddindikator som heter Advanced Decline Line. Och den är fortsatt stigande för Stockholmsbörsen och bekräftar den här starkt stigande trenden. Mm. Sen har vi omvända vinstvarningar som, som haglar in här. Det verkar som att analytikerna ligger fortfarande lite lågt i sin estimat. Mm. Trots att de har justerat upp efter Q2-rapporterna. Mm. Så att, ja, följer du trenden uppåt här eller... Ja det gör jag. Jag är med i marknaden i alla mina portföljer och eh, jobbar aktivt och tar hem sånt som har blivit alldeles för överköpt där fallhöjden är för hög och sen så försöka hitta bra entryläge i aktier som håller på att gunga upp då. Och jag har tittat en hel del på en fordonsaktie men du har en liten mm. observation där. Nej men jag såg bara i, jag har en liten tabell i, i min morgonrapport där på de olika sektorerna och den sektorn som har gått starkast senaste tre månader och en månad det, det är faktiskt fordonssektorn där mm. och jag tycker inte man pratar så mycket om, om den sektorn den har ju fått väldigt mycket stryk mm. och kollar man på, på relationen mellan den här sektorn och börsen så toppar den sommaren 2018 mm. och nu de senaste månaderna har den bottnat ur lite grann det ser ut som en klassisk bottenformation då, Just det. om man kollar på, på sektorn i relation mot börsen då. Mm. så att, jag tycker det ser spännande ut här och vi fick ju också en vinstvarning nyligen mm. Absolut, jag tycker Eller, generellt sett har ju datan varit ja, häxpool bland annat mm. då, och det har ju med fordonsrelaterat att göra vi har ju sett bättre och bättre leveranssiffror i USA ordersiffror på lastvagnar mm. och det är något som har gynnat Volvo som är nu uppe över sina tidigare mm. motståndstoppar, väldigt intressant då. jag skulle själv inte våga köpa dem på de här kurserna mm. därför fallhöjden är ju stor om någonting skulle hända och det är en grymt cyklisk aktie men det ser ju väldigt bra ut för Volvo, nettokassa är på ja, är det 50 miljarder ex pensionsutfästelser och leasingskulder då mm. så att de är ju väldigt solida. Och det är klart att um, börjar det återhämta sig så kanske man kan räkna med lite extra utdelning nästa år då. Mm. Så det är lite spännande då. Men de har ju även dragit med sig de bolag som vi har pratat om tidigare i podden då. Concentric till exempel, um, Bulten har vi pratat om, Haldex. Um, och tittar man på Haldex så börjar man en liten återreflektion. Man kan ju lyssna på de tidigare avsnitten men... Det, där håller aktien på att bryta upp från den fallande trenden. Så att mm. det kan vara läge att återhöra avsnittet när vi pratar mm. om underleverantörerna. Andra bolag i sektorn är Autoliv till exempel, eh, Mekonomen, eh, VBG Group, eh, Vioner. Mm. Eh, Vioner har ju gått väldigt eh, svagt senaste åren men nu börjar det vända uppåt. Då. Mm. Kollar man på eh, nybilsregistreringar i Europa eh, så, så går de också i rätt trend. Mm. Uh, i årstakt så, så föll de med 80% i mars. Det är helt otroligt. Uh, men nu har det återhämt sig de senaste månaderna. I augusti var det uh, minus 26%. Procent då. Mm. Så det är också någonting så, som såklart ger stöd till uh, den sektorn. Just det. Och du hade kollat lite grann på, på fängbolagen eller en liten observation där? Ja, precis. Det har kommit en uh, rapport um, på um, hur um, stor betydelse de har konkurrensmässigt och de har ju tillåtits att växa till monopolister eller duopolister i många fall då. 
Det har nyligen publicerats en rapport som heter Investigation of Competition in Digital Markets. 449 sidor, jag har inte läst hela, men konklusionen är i alla fall att man är väldigt orolig för att det här eroderar entreprenörskap i USA när de här jättarna har blivit så dominerande och de har ju köpt kompletterande förvärv bland annat då Facebook som ju äger flera av de stora varumärkena och eh, om man tänker på vad som hände med Microsoft för ett gäng år sedan så lyckades man ju eh, gå på det bolaget ganska hårt då, vilket tog väldigt lång tid innan aktien kom tillbaka då. Mm. och det här har ju varit en eh, ska jag säga en oro att fangbolagen kommer möta mer eh, restriktioner att de kanske måste delas upp och så, vidare. så det här är något man måste ta och titta på då och jag tycker rapporten, det är bara googla på den som jag då nämnde om man vill titta in lite mer på det här då och jag vet också att till exempel både Google och Facebook står ju risken här nu för att för en utfrågning då i finansdepartementet då och det handlar ju om att de har en dominerande ställning att de utnyttjar den på ett icke konkurrensvänligt sätt då. Så det kan mycket väl vara så att de här bolagen börjar hänga lite läpp här nu framöver och jag tittar igenom bolagen där och jag kan tycka mig se lite tendenser till huvudskuldror. Jag tycker att när vi ser svenska börsen så har den varit väldigt, väldigt stark, förvånansvärt stark men den amerikanska börsen har ju varit lite mer våblig och det beror ju just på de här tunga fangbolagen. Så till exempel Facebook tycker jag absolut har en potentiell huvudskuldra. Vi har Apple Apple, lika så. Det skulle kunna vara en fortsättningsformation men det är också en tendens till en, till en potentiell huvudskuld. Där. Och det brukar ju vara i sluttampen av en uppgång då. Amazon, lika så. Mm. Också potentiell huvudskuld. Där. Netflix, de vände ju upp ganska hårt i går. Och har ju lite undanröjt där omedelbara potentialen för att det skulle vara en huvudskuld som är bildande. Men det är en ganska stor formation som håller på att bildas. Det kan vara en toppformation då. Så att här bör man titta lite grann. Om man äger den här typen av bolag, även Alphabet, Google då, har också en helt klar huvudskuldra under bildande. Om den då faller tillbaka lite till så har den slutet den sista skuldran och då finns det ju nedsida de här bolagen. Så att kolla igenom om ni har de här bolagen, vad ni tycker att stopparna ska ligga om det inte är långsiktiga förstås, men mer motstånd kommer komma med de här bolagen framöver. Mm. Och det, det, det är ju sällan som en uh, marknad efter en längre uppgång vänder tvärt neråt utan precis som du säger så brukar det få någon typ av konsolidering mm. uh, där uh, aktier eller kan vara vilken marknad som helst egentligen rör sig sidledes. Mm. Uh, och fangindex toppar det där jag ser i början på, på september och sätter vi en uh, lägre topp uh, nu då så, så är det ju en potentiell huvudskuldra. Mm, absolut. Så att, uh, de behöver bryta uppåt till nya highs för att uh, bekräfta upp trenden där. Mm. Uh, och apropå nya uh, högsta nivåer, uh, jag lyssnade på Pontus uh, Schröder ja, just det. Uh, på en föreläsning med Staff här i veckan. Mm. Vad är Staff? Kan du inte berätta? Uh, Staff är Skandinaviens uh, tekniska analytikersförening. Uh, föreningen har funnits sedan uh, någon gång på 80-talet. Uh, jag har suttit med i styrelsen där i uh, drygt uh, tio år. Uh, varit med och, eller jag har byggt uh, deras hemsida uh, och hjälpt till att bjuda in uh, föreläsare. Mm. Så det är ett ideellt arbete för en ideell uh, förening. Mm. Uh, det kostar uh, tror jag 800 kronor per år för att vara medlem. Uh, och då får man gå på, på föreläsningar. Vi spelar in allting, lägger upp allting på, på hemsidan. Uh, så att där tycker jag man ska gå in och... Uh, Uh, ansöka om medlemskap då, om man har ett intresse för teknisk eller kvantanalys. Uh, uh, och uh, mycket av det som jag har lärt mig om, om börsen och teknisk analys har jag lärt mig via, via Staff. Just det. Uh, vi kör ungefär uh, en föreläsning per månad nu har vi varit uppehåll med, med corona. Då. Mm. Men nu, nu är vi igång igen. Och nu i veckan så hade vi då Pontus Schröder uh, kvantanalytiker uh, på Carnegie mm. uh, som där föreläste. Han, som du nämnde, var ju med podden här förut också. Mm. Någon gång i början. Ja, ihåg. precis. Så det är kanske dags ett återbesök för Pontus. Ja, absolut. Jag ska Någon skicka vi gärna in. Ja. Jag gillar verkligen Pontus approach till marknaden. För han kombinerar ju kvantanalys och statistik med lite mer traditionell teknisk analys. Och liksom för att studera trenderna. Mm. Kvantanalysen använder vi för att läsa av hur avkastningen ser ut historiskt. Givet olika parametrar. 
och därmed gör någon typ av sannolikhetsbedömning. Mm. Sen använder de teknisk analysen för att uh, finna trender. Antingen starka trender eller trender som har varit svaga och håller på att vända upp. Då. Mm. Uh, och något som Pontus pratade om föredraget var statistik vid uh, rekordnoteringar. Mm. Uh, och hans statistik visar där att det, det är bättre att köpa en all time high än att köpa till exempel på 12 månaders lägsta. Mm. Uh, och det här är på sex månaders sikt. Statistiken visar också att det är bättre att köpa en all time high än att köpa egentligen när som helst. Om man drar då ett backtest. Där Lite på... momentum tänk där. Framgång före framgång. Ja, precis. Ja. Och det här då USA-börsen. Jag kollar sen det var 70-talet. Mm. Så det här visar ändå att, att min känsla är att det är många som blir avskräckta av som rekordnoteringar. Mm. Men börsen har en drift uppåt och aktier. Så att det är helt naturligt att de gör rekordnoteringar. Man ska mm. inte vara rädda för dem. Och han visar också statistik på att eh, sannolikheten för en större nedgång på börsen den minskar avsevärt om vi nyligen haft en rekordnotering. Mm. Så ju längre t- tid det går efter en ny rekordnotering på börsen desto högre sannolikhet blir att eh, vi står inför en större nedgång. Då. Just det. Eh, så det tycker jag var intressant och en bra påminnelse. Jag lade upp en graf på, eh, nu i veckan på Twitter när eh, svenska börsen gjorde en rekordnotering med mm. statistik. Mm. Där. Så det här bekräftar ju den data som jag har. Mm. Jag tycker det är en bra påminnelse att uh, nya rekord i vår på börsen är positiva signaler. Ja, jättekul. Om vi tittar vidare rent allmänt på börsen då. Jag har mm. noterat Nobelpriset i kemi. Vet du vad det handlar om? Nej. Det handlar om uh, klippa i DNA-strängar. CRISPR-teknologin. Och då finns det ett bolag i USA noterat på amerikanska börsen som heter just CRISPR. Um, som har gått starkt. På den nyheten, det har ingenting mm. med de här forskarna att göra då. Men ändå är det intressant att det finns ett bolag som jobbar och håller på att forska kring det här. Hur man kan designa DNA och få bort sjukdomar och så vidare. Så att det är något som man kan tipsa lyssnarna och tittarna att in och kolla på det här bolaget. Och koifin.com är ju ett bra sätt att komma åt amerikansk information- kring olika bolag så in och kolla på CRISPR. Hur hittar du det här bolaget då? Om jag, får... jag har hört talas om det tidigare då. En okay. mm. kompis som är inne i bolaget och han mm. drog en bra story kring, kring det. Så att, mm. spännande teknologi. Jag har hittat bolag i veckan som heter Nordic Waterproofing. Ja, okej. Okay. Vad gör de? Uh, ja, waterproofing. <laughs> de, 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 de håller på mycket med takpapp. Jag vet vad takpapper från dig. Ja, absolut. Ja, ja, mitt precis. hus. Härligt. <laughs> så att de är ledande i Norden. Största marknaden är Finland och Danmark. Mm. Jag googlade faktiskt på takpapp. Jag googlade inte. Jag kollade på Google Trends. Hur många som hade googlat på takpapp. Mm. Och jag såg att i Sverige så är Google sökningen uppe på de högsta nivå någonsin. Jaha. Så det finns ett stort intresse för det nu. I Finland så var antalet Googling, Google-sökningar på den högsta nivån sedan 2005. Mm-hmm. Det är nu när det börjar regna. <laughs> Nej, men det är ju såklart efter corona. Det blir sådana hemma, bygga hemma. Ja, ja absolut. På, på finska heter det Katta och Hopa, takpapp. Mm-hmm. Men, men hur som helst, chartmässigt så ser aktien intressant ut. Jag skickar en graf till dig förut här idag. Mm. Och värderingen är attraktiv. Mm. Bolaget har en bra tillväxt och en stark balansräkning. Mm. Marknaden verkar värdera Nordic Waterproofing lite grann som ett cykliskt byggbolag. Mm. Aktien handlas till P14 framåtblickande 12 månader. Det växer organiskt med 14% i Q1. Under Q2 så växer det med 7%. Mm. Mer än hälften av omsättningen kommer från renoveringar som brukar vara mindre konjunkturkänsligt än till exempel byggmaterial. Mm. Uh, och som jag nämnde, de har en stark tillväxt, uh, jättefin tillväxt uh, med förvärv. Uh, man kan jämföra dem lite grann med en serie förvärvare som Indutrade eller Adtech. Okay. Och de här är betydligt mycket högre multiplar mm. än Nordic Waterproofing. Då. Mm. Och aktien har, uh, den handlas i stigande trend, tog en paus- uh, de senaste månaderna har konsoliderats, rört sig sidledes och nu försöker de bryta uppåt uh, från den här konsolideringen. 
och ge en sån här klassisk eh, köpsignal. Då. Eh, så att, eh, jag tycker att aktien borde värderas upp. Eh, jag tror att det eh, varit lite insiderförsäljningar senast tiden som kanske oroligt, oroligt folk. Men eh, man får inte glömma att det, det finns många anledningar till att eh, sälja. Mm. Så att jag, jag hoppas eller jag tror att det här utbrottet i aktien då, kanske kan skapa lite större intresse för, för, för bolaget. Mm. Jag hittar en annan aktie och det är Nolato. Jag mm. tänkte, tänkte på fordonsindustrin för de har nämligen lite produkter riktade mot fordonsindustrin. Då. Om man tittar på resultatutvecklingen så har de faktiskt sitt starkaste kvartal Q2 någonsin. Och då tänker man, mmm, vänta, det är covid. Mm. Nej, men det funkar inte så för dem. Därför att de har flera produkter som har efterfrågats annars under den här perioden. Då. Vaporizing heating products till exempel, där man har upplevt en lageruppbyggnad. Men det här orderläget har fortsatt att uh, vara starkt då. Och den enda svagheten var faktiskt inom eh, fordonsrelaterade verksamheter. Men där säger de också att de så mot slutet av kvartalet att liksom börja normaliseras. Mm. Och vi har ju sett Kina till exempel, där är produktionen uppe i full gång då. Och även nu lastvagnsmarknaden där man håller på att beta av allt man kan för det kommer nya år där för 2021 då. Så då kan man ju kanske fundera på att ja, de får nog lite hjälp det. det är av den delen då. Jag tror kanske inte att eh, det ska starta en omvärdering av Nolato. Men jag tycker att bolaget går väldigt fint som det gör nu. Och eh, om man lite grann eh, tänker på vad Pontus var inne på där. Så är ju det här bolag som försöker mm. jobba mot högre höjder hela tiden mm. då. Inne i en väldigt stark trend. Och eh, jag tror att det här skulle kunna fortsätta. Jag har sett eh, insiderköp på de här nivåerna. Och det börjar ju för att det finns förmodligen mer att hämta om de inte är helt felinformerade mm. de här insiderna. Ja, men äh, bolaget äh, ligger väldigt högt upp i min momentummodell mm. äh, på, på alla parametrar där förutom det är värderingen som, som, som är lite hög. Då, men det är klart att dyrare kan bli dyrare och det är det momentum handlar om. Ja, exakt. Men du tycker du inte vi ska ta och bjuda in Daval Joshi från BC? Det tycker jag. Börsnack med Hansen och Olavi. Hi and welcome back to uh, Börsnack. It's our 100 uh, episode so it's uh, quite a jubilee. So we, we would like uh, you to have that. And uh, we're very delighted to have you here. So thank you very much for participating. My pleasure. Um, thank, you. thank you for inviting me. Um, you come uh, you represent BCA but could you introduce yourself uh, you know something about yourself uh, how you have become the european strategist uh, in BCA sure so i've been the chief european strategist at BCA for 10 years but prior to that i have been an active investor an active professional investor so i was running a macro hedge fund for roughly five years prior to BCA. Um, before that, I was working for Societe, Gen <coughs> Societe Generale, investment banking, doing um, global strategy research. And prior to that, I was working at JP Morgan as a global equity investment manager. So I've had experience both on, on the investing side and on the research side, as I am now uh, doing at BCA Research. Uh, and can you please uh, present uh, BCA as a firm? Uh, what kind of products do you offer uh, worldwide? So BCA is the world's largest independent um, provider of macro research for um, financial markets. The, the great thing about BCA is it is completely independent. In, in other words, there is no conflict of interest. We don't do investment banking. We don't actually manage money for clients ourselves so it's all about the research and that that really makes um the quality of the research very high um and it's independent thinking which really sort of distinguishes it from the market what i do also is something quite unusual called um fractal analysis which is unavailable anywhere else in the marketplace because it it, it is unique to our offering and it is looking at um potential uh, liquidity crises in individual investments which trigger reversals in 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 the in the trend so it's a very good sort of reversal type analysis and it's 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 been very very successful over the last five years or so sounds very interesting well let's uh 
go into that a little bit later. Uh, you're responsible for Europe. I know you have your eyes on Sweden as well. Uh, and in March, I think it was, you wrote a piece on uh, Sweden, uh, which you claim that Sweden could be uh, positioned for a re-leverage um, post the pandemic. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? So I think what, the thing I, I, I noticed is that Sweden has... Um, the greater sort of potential difference between equity returns and bond returns. That's really, I think that's the piece you're referring to. Mm. So what we're looking at is the, you know, the likely return you will get from investing in the stock market versus the return you will get investing in the bond market. So on a very long-term horizon, we know the bond return because that's the the yield. So the 10-year yield is the return, the nominal return you will get owning Swedish bonds. And we know that's a very, very low number pretty much zero, maybe even, you know, slightly negative. So relative to that, we found that the um, very the likely return from the Swedish stock market, it's not, in absolute terms, it's not very high, but it's in the mid, mid single digits per year. So let's just say six, 7% per year relative to zero from the bond market or even slightly negative from the bond market. And what we found was that gap in Sweden between um, the potential return from the stock market, the the OMX versus um, Swedish 10-year bonds is the highest, one of the highest in the world. So in technical terms, this is known as the um, prospective equity risk premium. So what what we found is is that if you look anywhere in the world, where is the highest prospective equity risk premium? We found it was in Sweden. Mm -hmm. So this makes for for a, for an asset allocator in Sweden, it's very clear that you have to be in in stocks versus bonds, pr- provided that you have a very long term horizon, because this analysis will not work on three months. It won't even work on you know six months, one year. You need to have a very long term horizon, and generally it works pretty well so long as you you are happy to sort of ride out the sort of oscillations in mm-hmm. between. And you're looking at the beginning and the end of the five ten year period. Sweden sort of stands out as having this very nice equity risk premium. In that piece, you also um, said that you thought that we would have uh, go back to negative rates again. Do you still feel that? And what do you think of the experiment, which uh, a couple of central banks have deployed uh, worldwide with negative rates? Is that good? Uh, is that good thinking? Well. You know what, I, I think it's um, it hasn't been a complete disaster in the sense that we have had negative interest rates uh, in, in Sweden, We've have, we have them in, in the euro area. And in fact, now, even the Bank of England, having said we will not do negative interest rates, they're even considering it. So they're actually changing their mind to potentially considering negative interest rates. I think if negative interest rates are very modest, in other words, no lower than minus one, they are tolerable um, simply because most people are happy to accept a very small negative interest rate um, because of the, the, you know, because by putting money into a bank, the bank is providing you with a service of looking after your money and you're, you're, ha- you're happy to you know, pay a small negative interest rate. So I think that we will have s- small or slightly negative interest rates, but not, not substantially negative interest rates because that will completely... Um, destroy the banking system. So in the case of Europe and Sweden, we're kind of already there. It's not going to get that much more negative or lower. But I think the real issue is um, the US and other areas of the world, other developed markets where you're not close to that. Um, I I suspect they're going to try and and lower their rates ultimately to where they are in Europe, Japan, Sweden. That's what I think is more likely. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I noticed that uh, you wrote a, a piece on the, the Swedish krona this morning. Uh, so what's your uh, view on the direction of the Swedish krona? So again, I think that the really what's really amazing is that I think that when you look at the valuation of the Swedish krona relative to um, bond yield differentials, it shows that the Swedish krona is very cheap. So What's really important to realize is that for European currencies, the biggest driver of um, demand for the currency is is this thing called fixed income flows, because um, there's a lot of fixed income investment in in Europe. 
So what, what that's really telling us is that fixed income flows will, will, will be influenced by interest rate differentials. And this is one of the biggest drivers of the exchange rate. So what we're, what we're finding is that one of the reasons that the Swedish krona became exceptionally weak was because the Riksbank was early in this negative interest rate policy, one of the, one of the sort of pioneers, if you like. And that's what really took, that's one of the main reasons the uh, krona, the Swedish krona really collapsed um, a few years ago. But now what we found is that differential in interest rates has, has converged simply because, you know, other, other countries have also pulled their interest rates down. Um, and, the, and the krona has rallied roughly, you know, sort of high single digit percentage in the last uh, year or so. But we're saying relative to what's happened to bond yields, it hasn't rallied enough. Mm-hmm. So on that metric of, of currency valuation, I would say the Swedish krona has um, considerable upside, specifically against the US dollar. Mm-hmm. Perhaps not so much against the euro, but against the USD, potentially up to 20% upside. That's our calculation. Mm-hmm. That's a large uh, move, and I think that uh, suits uh, Swedish uh, uh, vacationers if we do get rid of this uh, pandemic. Yeah, so next year, maybe you go to the US, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, but remember also that this, the krona has um, you know, come down a very long way. So put, put that in context, that, you know, I think at sort of one point, um, the, the krona was something like, you know, it was... It was seven kronas to the dollar not so long ago so in in the sort of in, in the context of where you have been the 20 percent it doesn't you know it, it's actually a good gain potentially but in in the in the context of where it's been it, it, it doesn't it's not actually exceptional mm. in terms of the level you're going to get to what do you think about the uh large trade surplus surpluses that Europe and uh, Sweden uh, enjoys versus the US will that close and, and why how, how do you how do you picture that development yeah so the trade um, imbalance is is purely a function of the um, undervalued exchange rate so this is you know we can see a very very clear relationship between for example euro dollar or um, you know Swedish krona versus dollar and the and the and the imbalance so you know i, I kind of disagree you know i i kind of disagree with with president trump's explanation of the imbalance in because he's saying it's to do with um trade in practices um unfair competition tariffs etc i disagree with that where i dis where i agree with him is He's saying, look, there is an imbalance and the imbalance is or has been helping Europe versus the United States because, you know, the Americans are buying lots of uh, European products. Uh, the um, Europeans are not buying so many U.S. products as per what you were saying earlier about going on holiday to mm-hmm. America. Mm. So what, we're, what we found very clearly is this imbalance is to do with the exchange rate and the exchange rate has been taken down simply because Europe, you know, the, the Riksbank, ECB, have cut interest rates to very, very low levels much quicker than the United States. So in the long run, we think that that, that difference in, in bond deals and interest rates will narrow. And that means, by definition, the competitiveness of the two countries will also, or the two regions will also narrow, and the trade balance will resolve itself automatically. Already we're seeing that in the data on the European imbalance. It's, it's, you know, the surplus is narrowing quite sharply. Mm. I know you think there's a great uh, deal of misunderstanding regarding uh, Corona. Uh, can you explain? Yeah, so there's a lot of misunderstandings. I mean, I think the, um, you know, first misunderstanding is really that the, the danger is really from the immediate mortality. And if it doesn't... Uh, kill you, you know, then it's not really a dangerous disease. But I think that's a really big misunderstanding is what we're finding now is that it damages you. Um, you recover, but then you, your your lungs have lost 10, 20% of their capacity or your metabolic system is, is permanently damaged. So the real damage you may not feel for five, 10 years. 
So it's, it's a bit like if you got um, exposed to radiation, let's say, hopefully you know, this will never happen to anyone. It does not necessarily kill you, but 10 years down the road, you will develop illnesses. Like you will be more susceptible to leukemia, cancers, um, other health problems. So what we're finding about COVID is that it's a new disease and it appears to have what in, medic what in medical terms is called long-term sequelae. And these are sort of after effects. Um, so I think this obsession about the mortality rate being low is very dangerous and it's actually a misunderstanding. I think the other sort of misunderstandings are that the, um, the economic impact is from the lockdowns. So, you know, it's a sort of a lockdown or a sort of government created recession. This is, this is very big misunderstanding because as we know, you know, as you know, in Sweden, there was no official government lockdown. And yet we know that the Swedish economy had the, had, had the sharp, you know, a very sharp contraction. In fact, very similar to Denmark and Denmark had a very aggressive lockdown. So we have, you know, we have Denmark, very aggressive lockdown, Sweden, no lockdown, but the economic performance is identical. So what this is telling you is it's not about the government policy. It is really about individual consumer behavior. Consumers become much more cautious if there is a pandemic. So they're not going to go out to the bars, clubs, restaurants. They're going to be much more cautious. That's what causes the contraction in activity. It's called social consumption. Social consumption drops very sharply. Does not matter if there's a lockdown or if there is a lock, you know, whether there is a lockdown or not. That's irrelevant. So that's also a misunderstanding. Um, I think there's, you know, several other misunderstandings. I think one of the most important, uh, potentially, is that the pandemic is a kind of an exogenous shock. And once it's gone, we will go back to life as we were before the pandemic. But this is a misunderstanding because in many cases, what's happening is the pandemic is accelerating structural changes that were already happening. So, for example, the um, de-urbanization, so people are moving away from the cities, this was already happening before the pandemic. So the pandemic is accelerating. It is not the cause. It is an accelerant. It's a catalyst, not the cause. Likewise, for the shift to online retailing. So now a lot of people do their groceries online. They do all their shopping online. This was starting before the pandemic. So if the pandemic ends, it's not going to suddenly go back. Likewise for, you know, things like we're doing now, um, meetings by, re you know, remote, you know, this is also, this is going to stay even when the pandemic ends. So a lot of these changes that the pandemic has accelerated are going to stay. So we're not going to do as much business travel. We're not going to do as much um, working in the office. We're not going to um, be shopping in bricks and mortar retailers. All of these things are permanent. And the key point is that this is going to destroy a lot of jobs, irrespective of the pandemic. So what I'm really saying is just because we have a vaccine for the pandemic, let's say next year, it does not mean that we go back to how we were living. There's big structural changes and it's the, the big casualty is the jobs market. So we're going to have a very high level of structural unemployment, unfortunately, irrespective of the pandemic. There's been a lot of different uh, views on how to um, cope with uh, COVID um, in Europe and worldwide. Um, which parts of Europe do you think uh, have done the best so far uh, from what we can see? Is there anyone that you know stands out? It's really difficult to say because um, the countries the countries appear to be doing badly, and then suddenly the statistics change, and it looks like they're doing well, and then suddenly again the statistics change, they they've been doing badly. For example, we thought Italy was doing badly at the beginning, but over the course of the last nine months, they have actually. Um, you would say their overall response has been pretty good. Um, I would say that looking at the numbers in aggregate, though, I think it looks like Germany has probably had the best overall policy response. Um, 
And what characterizes Germany is a kind of um, if their, their government is quite decentralized to the individual states, and, and that's worked pretty well. So, you know, if, if there's a, you know, a crisis in um, Bayern, you know, in Bavaria, then it, we, you, you let the local state deal with it in terms of its policy response, which could be quite different from, say, you know, North, North Rhine-Westphalian. You know, it could be that there's, there's very different um, disease characteristics. So that element of decentralization, I think, has helped the German response. Of course, you know, Sweden has had a very unique response. Um, and I would say on, on the, there's one very good side of it, one very good aspect of it, is there's a sort of inherent trust between the people and the government, which I, which I see is greater in Sweden than in other countries. So, you know, for example, in, in the UK, there's a lot of criticism of the government on a day-to-day -day basis. When you look at the Swedish media, there isn't as much aggressive criticism of the government. So there's like a mutual trust the government trusts the people to do the right thing. The people trust the Swedish government to give them the right advice. So that, and that's why there was no explicit lockdown. But what I think is the danger is this um, p potential, I, I don't know, objective of getting herd immunity. So there is this sort of theory that, look, you know, let, just, let, let, let the disease spread naturally so that the majority of the people have had the disease and therefore you get this natural immunity against it. So I think that's a dangerous policy because of what I was saying earlier, which is that potentially 10 years later, everyone is going to get some long-term effect. We just do not know. So herd immunity will work if we know the disease well, if we know all of its long-term effects. But for a new disease, we just do not know whether, you know, in 10 years' time, we're going to all have, you know, huge lung problems or, ner you know, problems with the nervous system, metabolic system, we just don't know. And therefore, pursuing herd, men herd immunity without knowing the disease is quite a dangerous policy. So that's yeah. the sort of, I think the overall trust system between the government in Sweden and the people is really good. But pursuing herd, 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 herd immunity is potentially quite dangerous. All right. Yeah, quite agree. So let's talk about uh, investment uh, strategy. Uh, what's your uh, current uh, strategy at the, the moment? Um, so I think that the the, the sort of immediate. I, I was kind of kind of concerned about the sort of late summer period uh, because markets had had moved very very sharply higher um, from mid end of march through to the early summer and i thought look you know everything you know we, everyone is assuming we're sort of we've cured the problem so recently i've been kind of look there's no point chasing the market um market's going to be range bound which has broadly been the tr the case because i think since i guess, i guess august to now market's kind of pretty flat um and i think we sort of after the, I, I think after the election, the U.S. election, which is only whatever three, four weeks away, I think a lot of the sort of immediate headwinds may disappear. So at the moment, I've been, I've been tactically cautious, but I might remove that, hmm. you know, in the next few weeks. Um, you, you will uh, revert that to a more bullish uh, view from uh, neutral. Yeah, because I think that we've had. Um, uh, the, the period through the late summer was a period of danger. And that's probably, and that's generally been true. Although we haven't had a big correction, the markets have just oscillated. And I think that um, on, on, on sort of my analysis, I think that we will have a sort of another potential leg up, short leg up later this year. No, I'm not talking about going up 20%, but I'm saying that some, a lot of the danger in the market, you know, was, was focused around this this time. And it may, you know, I think November, de November December could be a kind of um, a period of re release, let's, let's just say, or relief. Um, irrespective of who wins the election, by the way, because both, both sides have promised some sort of stimulus. It doesn't matter whether it's Democrat or, you know, Republican. So I think there's going to be a bit of relief. And then over the sort of one one year horizon, I still think we need to be in those areas of the stock market which are benefiting from the new world that we're living in. 
So, re, you know, remote working, the um, de-urbanization, um, the, the sort of focus to online commerce and retail. So I still think that we should be in the growth areas. The areas that are going to be the winners of the new world are the areas you want to be in. That's why I'm still reluctant to be in um, value sectors like, you know, banks or um, materials and so on. I'm just, on a one-year horizon, I don't think that's the place to be. What's your take on the long-term uh, yields and uh, inflation uh, expectations? So, so you're talking about the stock market or, the, or you're talking about bond yields and... Yeah, the, the yeah, bond the yields. Bond yields. Yeah, so I think bond yields have to stay quite, you know, have to stay very, very low because... Um, look, as I was saying earlier, one of the things we do know is there is going to be, uh, unfortunately, high structural unemployment because the, the the sectors that have been most hit by the pandemic and this 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 new way of living are labour intensive. So, you know, when we when we look at retailers, hospitality, leisure transportation these for for every unit of output they employ a lot of people so we are seeing a lot we're going to see a, a big restructuring of the jobs market you know we're going to see a lot of people who are working in restaurants bars hospitality and so on they're going to have to find new careers unfortunately and whilst we have this very high level of sort of structural unemployment central banks will be forced to keep interest rates depressed. And furthermore, it's really hard to see a sustained inflation because these are the people who tend to borrow money. But if these, you know, if, if these low-income jobs don't exist, the demand for bank credit will remain quite low structurally. And therefore, it's very hard to see a sustained inflation. Without the inflation, with central banks keeping interest rates low, it will, um, you know, necessarily... Uh, I mean, yields also stay low. They can go up a little bit, but they'll be stuck in a sort of quite low range for for, for, for a very long time. Mm. Um, me and Eric uh, talks a lot about early early indicators and, and PMIs, for instance. Do um, you think uh, PMI data have any predictive value for the stock market? Well, at the moment, especially no, because what's driving... Um, the short-term changes in, in demand is the development of the pandemic. Um, you know, when we have the sort of second wave or third wave, what hap- you know, as we are having in Europe right now, then obviously what happens is that we, people will come, go back into their shells. They won't be out going to the, um, you know, going out doing their shopping or going out to bars, restaurants and so on. So... By the time the PMI comes out, it's already happened because the PMI is, is you know, is, is, is four weeks late relative to the, 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 the point in time it is, it is referring to. So the PMI is quite, you know, normally that's fine. Four weeks is not a huge amount. But in the, in the case of the evolution of the pandemic, which is a day-to-day evolution, the PMI is already very historic. It's telling us what happened four weeks ago. Mm. And a lot, and in a, in a pandemic, a lot can change in four weeks, and therefore I'm not um, a huge fan of trading of of the PMI. I mean, the only exception to that is if, for example, you know where it's going to be. Like, let's just say the PMI is coming out um, this afternoon. Let's just say, um, and the market expects it at 50, and you think it'll be at 52. Then, of course, you can trade it because when it comes out at 52 versus expected 50, the market will go up. But that's the only way I think you can trade. Once it comes out, it's hard to trade it. Mm. If you know roughly where it's going to be, then you can trade it. Uh, and besides uh, the uh, PMI data and uh, Corona uh, stats, is there any other kind of data uh, or markets that you are using for predicting the stock markets, like commodities or uh, uh, that kind of markets? I mean, I think that one thing that we we look at, which is can be quite useful, is a, <clears throat> it's a lead indicator of the economy is, is, is developments of credit. Because what happens is that if we know what's happening to credit flows, um, then we can, we can sometimes predict what will happen to demand. Because simple, the simple reason is, if you borrow money, 
then you, you're borrowing it to spend it. You don't borrow money generally to just keep it in the bank. So, but when you borrow money, you don't spend it immediately. So you borrow, you know, you borrow the money, it goes into your bank account, let's say to, to um, let's say you're buying a house or you're buying um, consumer goods, then there is a bit of a delay between getting the loan and spending it. So if you know what's happening to the loan, then you might you, you have some potential idea of what will happen to spending. So sometimes that's a good um, leading indicator of the economy. Not always, because at the moment what's happening, you know, some of the loans are um, going into the economy. Some of the loans are just being used as a sort of emergency, you know, contingency working capital for companies because they're thinking, look, we're in a crisis period. We need to have some cash available. So if, they, if we have any credit lines, we will use them or we will open them up. But we don't necessarily want to spend the money. We just want to have cash available because we are in a crisis period. So maybe it doesn't work as well. But I think the, the concept is still very, very useful because some of the money will go into the economy. And if you know what's happened to lending, then you've got some predictive power of what will happen to the economy. Has the credit impulse uh, started to fade or is it uh, still very strong? Well, it, it is actually, from a short-term perspective, it has short, started to fade. Because yeah. if you think about it, the, the, <clears throat> the, the policy response to the, pan, the, the pandemic in you know, March, April was phenomenal. You know, we just had uh, unprecedented um, monetary stimulus which did show up in the credit numbers. And from that very, very high level that we had in the summer, it's very difficult to keep it at that level. So it has started to fade. Yeah, I mean, it's it's start, started to fade um, short term in China and in the in the US and, and, the, and, and Europe, not yet. But because the if we look at the peak, it occurred later. So that's really what's happening. I think the Euro- European numbers will also start to fade on the impulse you know, in, in late, you know, in, into the autumn of this year. And besides uh, the credit uh, uh, impulses, uh, is there any other markets you're watching, like uh, lumber price, for instance? Well, I think for certain economies, um, what is happening to the oil price is 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 quite important. So remember that. You know, Europe does not generally, you know, produce much oil, you know, apart from there's a few countries like Norway, that Norway is a big producer, Russia is a big producer, you know, UK has got some production. But most countries are generally consumers of oil. I think Germany is um, probably the most important consumer in Europe. So if you like oscillations in the oil price do affect uh, German consumption simply because they, you know, they, one of the interesting things about Germany is, as I as I, as I was saying earlier, so it's a very decentralized economy because Germany was created out of these ten whatever separate states, which were which were reunified under Bismarck quite recently, about you know hundred hundred and uh, you know fifty years ago. So quite quite recent. So there's a lot. There's no one big city in Germany. There's a lot of Equal is is a very decentralized economy. You have Munich, Hanover, Frankfurt, you know Berlin. So, what we notice is that it's it is a, it's got a very high road traffic intensity per GDP, and and hence um, any change in gasoline prices is quite uh, Im- impactful for the German economy. So, I would say oil prices is, is another indicator, or in the impulse on the oil price is quite important for for a lot of European economies. On uh, other uh, indicators, I know you mentioned uh, fractal analysis, uh, and I've been following BCA for uh, over ten years. So I, I know you've uh, been quite keen on this. But could you explain uh, a bit s- simple? What is fractal analysis, and what can it be used for? Sure. So I think that the, what we have to realize is that the a healthy stock market or a healthy financial market, it doesn't have to be stocks, it could be bonds or anything, requires investors of 
different time horizons to be present. So long-term investors need to be there, medium-term investors and short-term investors. And if we have all time horizons, then it is a good sign. And the simple reason is that this creates liquidity. Because in a, in a market, if someone is buying a lot of shares, by definition, someone else must sell lots of shares because the seller and buyer must match. So the only way we can do this without disrupting the market is if we have different time horizons because then they will disagree about the price. So long-term investor will say, well, I'm interested in value. This stock uh, is expensive, so I want to sell The short-term investor is interested in momentum and he's saying, well, the stock's going up, so I want to buy. So when you have the different time horizons, then the value inv long-term investor, the short-term investor, they will, they will trade with each other and there's liquidity and the, and, the, and the price will stay stable. But if everyone becomes a short-term investor, then there is no one on the other side. And, and the price will have to either drop very sharply depending on you know, whether, it, you know, whether it's been going up or it will have to go up very sharply to, to match the buyer and the seller. And that's really what fractal analysis is. It's, it's very simple. What we're trying to do is work out, are there lots of time horizons in the market? If there are, that's fine. But occasionally, the, the time horizons collapse to short-term investors only. And then you've got a really big problem. And that's something you could visualize uh, like an indicator or how do you perceive that? How can you show that? We, what we do is we, we, it's called, um, we, we, we measure what's known as the fractal dimension of the market. And if the fractal dimension is, gets to a very low level, it tells you the fractal structure has collapsed. The fractal structure is simply telling, you know, the uh, fractal structure is telling you, is there a variety of time horizons in the market? If the answer is yes, it means fine. You know, there's nothing to worry about. But if the fractal structure has collapsed, then that's telling you, no, there is no longer a variety of time horizons. And potentially you have a reversal coming up very, very soon. And that's that's the essence of it. So the the it's there's a little bit of mathematics involved, um, and I you know anyone who's interested should um, subscribe or or read the, um, the 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 strategy that I'm writing because we describe it. We 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 list quite a few investments every week, and we say look these are the ones or this is the one this week which I think is particularly worrying or an opportunity, and I think you'll get the idea of how to use this if you if you if you follow it for a few weeks you you you'll, you'll get the drift of it mm. so, so a, a low number would be um a sort of an, a warning sign um so then you would need to pay uh, more attention to your positions so that that is what it's basically about yes yeah, so a low number is all the low number is telling you is that there is too much trending too much groupthink um you know, too much, um, how can I put it, kind of euphoria or too much depression because, it, you know, it, it could be either way. So you can see, for example, in, in March when the market really collapsed, by about March 15th, 16th, what we're saying is, look, there is just too much depression right now relative to the response that is likely to happen. And at that point, you actually say, this is a buying opportunity, So it can happen in both directions. You can have too much depression or you, much, you can have too much euphoria on the upside, too much depression on the downside. Mm. And that's telling you there is a potential reversal coming depending on what's, what's happened before. It could go up from a depression or down from a euphoria. Can you give us a few uh, examples of uh, markets that uh, recently uh, had a uh, signal in this model? Yeah, so I think this year it's been very successful because in I think in... Um, Early January, we were just saying that the very strong run in stocks was vulnerable. Um, of course, at the time, we did not know it'd be to do with COVID. But because the, what happened was COVID, in a sense, made the sell-off very aggressive. 
But our theory, and we, we wrote about this in January, even before the pandemic really accelerated, we said, look, some, something will come along and we think that it would catalyze some sort of sell-off. At, you know, it could have been anything. It could have been escalating trade war, could have been geopolitics. Um, as it happened, it was coronavirus. So in January 9th, we said you should sell equities, buy bonds. Then, in, you know, as I was saying earlier, in March, I think it was right March 15th, we said now the sell-off is really aggressive and there is too much pessimism according to the fractal structure, which has really collapsed. So on, on March, I think, 11th, we said you should buy equities. And then later in the summer, as I was saying earlier, we said, look, this the, the run-up has now gone too far. We think the market will consolidate. So I think in around um, mid of July, mid, middle July, we said you can now take profits in equities. So th- that we, we basically picked the top, bottom, and the second top. More recently also, we were just saying that the sell-off uh, in the dollar was ex- was was overdone, and that was uh, about four weeks ago. We said, "Look, um, the, the the dollar is going to, you know, maybe the dollar will be structurally weak over the next few years, but the the, the sell off that we've seen in the short term is too much." So we said, "You should you should actually reverse that, um, you know, but buy the dollar for the short term," which and that worked extremely well. So you know, I can give you lots of examples. I could give you, you know, we've done. Mm-hmm. 200 trades over the last few years so i can give you many 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 examples but i just you know those are the those are the those are the main ones this year which which were really quite important uh, and besides the fractal uh, model uh, what kind of other inputs uh, do you think it's important for a tactical uh, view let's say one to three months so always oh, so, you know i would say one of the most important things is, is of course, central banks, even even now. Um, you know, well, actually, this I'm going to change my mind on this a little bit because mm-hmm. up until now, central banks have been really important. And, of course, now everyone realizes, you know, what can central banks do? You know, interest rates are zero or negative. So recently, um, what we found is it's, it's exactly the same, but for, for fiscal. Um, because everyone says, well, look, you know, monetary policy cannot do what it did five years ago because interest rates are already quite quite sort of close to the lower band. So more recently, what's been driving the markets from a tactical perspective is, are we going to get fiscal stimulus or are we not going to get fiscal stimulus? So it's trying to ascertain, you know, when does the fiscal stimulus come? How big is it going to be? That is now, ta- you know, the tactical driver of the market as it has been for the last few weeks. Everyone's just saying, are we going to get a new stimulus from the United States? Um, and that was really sort of causing these these sort of oscillations in the stock market. And now everyone is saying, um, we're probably not going to get one, but we don't care about the next four weeks, what's going to happen after the election. So that's really what's driving the stock market from a tactical perspective. So it's, it's actually shifted from monetary stimulus to fiscal stimulus. Mm-hmm. If you can get, a, get an idea of what's going to happen on the fiscal stimulus front and the timing, that does help you tactically now nowadays. That's very interesting. Um, I think we need to conclude, uh, but we have some roundup questions uh, for you as well. Um, I'm asking uh, for a friend, uh, how do one become to work at BCA? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that you, just, you have to have a um, really broad interest in the financial markets. Um, be original. Be an original thinker. Uh, be an independent thinker. I think that's a really important thing because what we're, we're, we are not tied to any other business. You know, we're not tied to investment banking or or, or actually running money. So it requires, a, you know, in, in, independence of thought. Um, also, I think these days it requires a sort of breadth of knowledge. The, the markets are not just about economics. They're also about psychology. They're about history. They're about politics. They're about mathematics. So... Having a breadth of knowledge of subjects is actually very useful these days, which maybe is underestimated compared to 10 or 20 years ago. Because in the in the old days, it was like, are you good at economics? Do you understand finance? Then you can do investment strategy. Now it's much more complicated. We have to understand, you know, biology. This year is about biology, mm-hmm. epidemi- epidemiology, you know, how, how do diseases spread? So having sort of breadth of knowledge, breadth of skill set is... Um, 
you know, I think I think that's that's really important at BCA. Sounds great. I'll I'll uh, let sure to tell my friend that. <laughs> or is it you, Jonas? <laughs> Could be. <laughs> uh, if you're looking into your own uh, experience, uh, which ones do you have now that you hoped you had for like uh, maybe ten years ago or beginning of your career? Yes, yeah, so as I was saying, I think that I've become a better historian. I think I've become a, you know a better psychologist. Because I think that when you think about the market, it's 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 about how millions or billions of people interact with each other. It's about millions of individual decisions that drive the overall market. So the market is what's known as complex adaptive system, and this is also about um, behavior psychology. It's about fear and um, how people behave under stress, and, and for that, history is a very very good guide. So a lot of the things we you know we, we think are new are, are just a sort of different form of what happened a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, and so on. So I think that um, now I, I think I'm I understand other aspects or other other disciplines that drive the, that, that drive the financial markets much better than I did ten or twenty years ago. Sounds great. Could you uh, give us a life hack? Um maybe from the pandemic or something uh, you would like to share uh, sorry a life life hack something that makes your life uh, easier in in some sort of way i think this you know i think that this sort of work, working from home for some people is you know is is isn't great but for me it's been really good um because you know it it sort of cuts out um a lot of wasted time as far as i was concerned you know, on a train that's stuck at signals or um, in traffic, you know, um, trying to get to a meeting. These these things are, you know, frustrating. And, and in, in in this world of sort of remote working, they've disappeared. So I think that's that's absolutely great. I think that in a, in a way you can um, be more productive. Some people don't like it. Other people do. For me, it's worked extremely well um you know if you can demarcate your life um without having to go to the office or go to different places then it works really well you know you can sort of have more time with your family mm. you can have more time walking your dog and funnily enough what i found is that sometimes you know when some of the most productive thoughts or ideas come when i'm walking the dog or You know, when I'm, um, you know, playing with 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 with, with my child, you know, is is it's, it's, you know sometimes that sort of variety in your life can actually help you. Hmm. Um, I think the really important thing is to have a very balanced life. Um, to not spend ninety nine percent of your time doing one thing, you know. Whether it's you know your work or whether it's if you're if you're a you know a full time mother or father, you need a break. You need to balance your life. You need to balance the physical and the mental. That's very important. So you need mental stimulation. You need physical stimulation. Um, and I think that overall there's a great synergy from that. So if you're physically fit, you're mentally fit. If you're mentally fit, you're generally physically fit. So that's these are all these are all. Um, Issues that have really become um, come to the forefront during the pandemic for me, anyway. Mm. I think that uh, is very good words, uh, Mr. Daval Joshi. Thank you very much for participating in uh, Bush Snack. Uh, we really enjoyed that uh, discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. My pleasure, and thank you for the honor of being your hundredth podcast. Mm. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Och Jonas, om vi ska sammanfatta veckans avsnitt, vad vill du lyfta fram? Ja, att börserna är ganska okej. Okay. Vi ser också intressanta tecken i fordonsindustrin och där kan man in och gräva och grotta lite grann. Men huvudnumret det var ju intervjun med Daval Joshi. Mm. Från BCA. Vad tog du med dig från det här samtalet? Det var mycket uh, intressanta saker som jag har tagit med mig. Uh, jag noterar också morse att han skrev en uh, lite research där på Svenska Kronan. Mm. Uh, som man ser är undervärderad. Han såg en uppsida på, 
på svenska kronor på, på 20%. Mm. Eh, tror det var, mot, var det mot euron eller dollarn? Ja, mot dollarn. Mot dollarn, ja. Eh, sen tycker jag också intressant att prata om just eh, corona. Att det var mycket missuppfattningar där. Bland annat att det är ofarligt. Menar, man kan få se symptom efter 5-10 år mm. eh, som kan vara allvarligare. Mm. Eh, vilket jag tycker är intressant. Och så just att lockdown inte är anledning bakom nedgångar i ekonomin utan det är framförallt konsumentförtroendet Exakt. som är det viktigaste. Mm. Att eh, folk inte är ute och konsumerar. Uh, och uh, att det kanske inte var uh, corona som var uh, katalysatorn uh, till, uh, till nedgången. Mm. En, enligt honom så trodde han att den här nedgången på börsen uh, sk- skulle ske oavsett om corona mm. eller någonting annat kom. Mm. Enligt då hans fraktalanalys uh, där Just det. som fick uh, blinkade varningssignaler redan innan corona kom. Mm. Och som verkar varit framgångsrik under året. Flera olika mm. så här, tillgångar har de lyckats tajma bra. Han har gjort väldigt många trades över åren där. Då, så att han har ju fått den här mm. metoden att funka bra. Mm. Eh, låga räntor. Mm. Eh, fortsatt låga inflationsförväntningar. Eh, navigerar efter. Han nämnde också att eh, inköpschefsindex inte är ledande längre. Utan det är, all, det är till exempel coronastatistiken som, som man kollar på. Mm. Senast tiden har det varit mycket också centralbankspolitiken. Men där tyckte han att centralbankspolitiken kanske inte är lika viktig nu. Efter att vi fått den här starka kreditimpulsen som nu börjar fejda. Utan nu är det kanske lite mer fiskala eh, stimulanser som, som marknaden noga eh, mm. ut och, och letar efter. Mm. Och man, man handlar lite grann på uttalanden som, som kommer då kring eh, finanspolitiken. Just det. Och sen kreditdata är också mm. viktigt som ledande indikator. Det är ju allt från man drar korten, det pratar han inte om i och för sig men mm. det är ju en del i det epitetet. Så att det är intressant att liksom höra vad en sån strateg som han är och hur BC funderar kring det här. Då. Mm. Jag tyckte det var jätteintressant. Just för att han sa att krediter eller de man lånar ju för att konsumera och det blir ju såklart ledande. Och på den frågan så svarar han också på att han kollar mycket på oljepriset. Just för att få en känsla för ja, efterfrågan och så där i ekonomin. Då. Mm. Så att, och där kollar jag också indirekt på oljepriset. Jag kollar på high yield i USA mm. som påverkas väldigt mycket av oljepriset. Mm. Jag har ju fallit tillbaka de senaste månaderna lite grann i samklang med den här kreditimpulsen som har fejlat. Då. Just det. Och den här fraktalteorin, eller modellen som man kör, mm. jag vet att du har börjat kika lite grann på den. Ja, jag har ju använt den i tio år också och mm. jag tycker att den är träffsäker. Den ser ju väldigt brusig ut i modellform då, men den funkar och det är ju en varningssignal då. Det är inte en trading indikator per se utan det är mer att nu är det lite fara och färde så funderar jag mm. lite grann på dina positioner då. Och i så mått mätt så funkar den bra tycker jag då. Mm. Det är inte någon jättekomplicerad matte bakom så att det är lite förvånande att det inte är liksom större på marknaden. Men BC har gjort det lite grann som sin, ja, en av favoritindikatorerna. Då. Mm. Så att det, det var väldigt spännande. Och sen så berättar han ju också om liksom, vad, man, vad man var tvungen på att vara bra på. Psykologi och historia. Det är flera aspekter. Det är inte bara vanlig nationalekonomi som, som gäller om man ska vara strateg på BC. Då. Det är som Alexander Bard skulle kunna söka över. Absolut. Historiker Säkert. och psykologi. <laughs> och och bred, bred kunskap nämnde han också. Så att, ja. Ja, det var superintressant uh, samtal där med ja. honom. Uh, väldigt kul att han var med. Mm. Och det här är ju för professionella investerare ska jag säga då. Och um, då finns det en um, svensk agent för det här som man kan kontakta men gå via oss. Um, den svenska killen heter Felix Schleimer. Och uh, vi kan, uh, om man är intresserad då, vidarebefordra kontaktuppgifter så tar uh, Felix kontakt med er. Så maila eller ta kontakt med mig eller Erik så ser vi till att förmedla den kontakten där. Mm. Med de orden så rundar vi av dagens sändning. De bolag som vi nämner här är inga rekommendationer, det är observationer och eh, ta hand om er. Trevlig helg. Tack och hej.